Well, it's uh, truly an honour for someone like me to be here, so my thanks to Wyatt for making it happen. The next few minutes may be slightly different to what you'd normally expect because I didn't bring a presentation. Um, what I did was I took the last eight and a half years of my life, condensed it down to about ten minutes, and I've tried to make it sound interesting. So, <laughs> um, I'm Nigel, I'm just an ordinary man, and I'm fortunate to wear an extraordinary piece of technology. Now, for most people, September the 19th, 2006, pretty unremarkable day. For me, it was the day my life changed forever. As was said, I was working on an industrial blender. The drums started to spin. I got dragged inside, and my arm became trapped against the drum wall. The drum stopped, and then, like a pendulum, it came back the other way. Um, it was over in seconds. It was long enough to feel my arm being crushed, and it was long enough to hear the bone snap. Long enough to realise I'd really done it this time. I managed to get myself free, and uh, the paramedics took over. A week later, I'm in hospital. My left leg's been cut open from the knee to the hip, and a piece about the size and shape of a rugby ball's been cut away and grafted to my right arm. The bandages are off my right arm, so I take a look. There's scars and stitches everywhere with this huge lump of leg sticking out of the middle of my forearm. It looks like Frankenstein met Popeye. Looks aren't important, the doctors tell me. Um, by the time all my surgery's finished, plastics will do their magic. They then went on to tell me all my further surgery. But whether it was the morphine, the doctor speak, or a combination of the two, the only thing I really understood was 10 years of treatment with no guarantees. So between bouts of surgery and infection, I turned to the internet, trying to find out exactly what I was letting myself in for and what my options were. Easter 2007, I'm back at hospital. I've been speaking to the surgeon, he's just left. A week earlier, I'd taken all the notes I'd made. I, I gave them to him. I asked him to look at things from my perspective. He did. He saw the big picture, and he chopped my arm off. A textbook amputation is aimed to give the, the patient the longest possible bone length. This makes prosthetics easier to fit and more comfortable to wear. And the surgeon explained, in order to give me the longest possible bone length, it had to cut through the centre of my graft. Uh, I was soon to realise that shape is just as important as length. I was told my company had really good insurance. I'd get the best treatment possible. So I thought, OK, a, a bionic hand, no problem, back to work. Job done. Yeah, right. A small piece of the insurance policy meant that instead of the private treatment I'd been told to expect, I was dumped onto the NHS, put on a standard three-stage treatment plan and told, we don't do bionic arms here. Stage one is a passive limb. This is to get the patient used to the weight and the feel of a, a prosthetic. Mine didn't fit too well. It was an inch and a half longer than my left arm. Had no function. Didn't really improve the quality of my life. And every now and again, it would slip off in the high street. <laughs> but you don't get to do stage two until you've completed stage one. Stage two is what we call a body-powered system. <laughs> Again, mine didn't fit too well, and the harness that was wrapped around my shoulders was really uncomfortable. But at least it stopped my arm falling off. My hook, invented in around about the 1800s sometime, is controlled by a piece of string and a rubber band. At the end of 2008, I'm back in hospital. Two years of trying to ram a flared stump into a tapered socket has been causing pressure sores, infections, and, and, and quite a lot of pain. So plastics have been doing their magic. Three months later, I'm finally clear of infection. <laughs> the stump looks much the same, but time to start over. By this stage, physically, I'm not in very good shape. I used to be the hunter-gatherer, provider for my wife and family. 
Now, I struggle to wipe my backside. Psychologically, I'm falling apart. I've moved into the spare room. Night times are for nightmares. I wake up flailing my stump against the wall or covered in sweat, maybe screaming. Daytimes, they're for the mood swings. The fears, the self-doubts, the frustration and the anger. The sudden raging anger that I often unfairly take out on my wife and my son. I'm too busy losing my mind to realise they also lost my arm. And during what's probably the lowest period of my life, I notice a change in other people's attitudes towards me. Strangers will often avoid me. Very rarely do people make eye contact or start a conversation. Oh, they'll stop and stare. I see the looks of pity or fear, <coughs> disgust. Sometimes they'll just point and laugh, maybe yell insults. I become withdrawn. I stop going out. I start shutting myself away from everyone. Sometimes for days on end, I'll sit outside in the garage, just me and my demons. Well, 2009 started pretty slowly, but it ended with a bang. <laughs> bang, heart attack, dead. Game over, I think. Papworth, they think differently. They put six stents into my heart and send me off to cardio rehab. So we fast forward now to 2012. I finally hit stage three. I've been using a myoelectric. It's a grypher. It's kind of basic, but very easy to use. I had to have the sh socket made as short as possible so that it was comfortable. It lets me wear it for a couple of hours a day. But finally, I have enough money together to be able to afford to get this socket custom made. To me, this is the most important part of the whole thing. If you can't wear this every day, all day, without pain or discomfort, it doesn't matter what the end piece is like, you're not going to wear it at all. I've not been back to hospital since I bought this three years ago. One day I get a call from a prosthesis, a company called RSL Steeper have a new prosthetic. They want someone to test it, am I interested? And a short while later, I get to be the first person in the world to start testing the B-Bionic V3. It's a myoelectric. It's fast, it lifts 40 kilograms, it's got eight functional grip patterns, and it's easy to use. Over time, the way I control it has actually evolved. Initially, in order to make this open and close, this was the only movement I had to make in my head. Now, my phantom limb and my prosthetic seem to have been connected by my brain. When I open and close my fingers, I feel my phantom fingers driving the movement before the prosthetic moves. I feel my thumb lift before the prosthetic moves. <coughs> it's almost as if I'm reconnecting. Eventually, when the technology is there to do this, I'll be playing the piano. When I use my grypher, I'm back to doing this movement. This is my grypher. This is what you get on the NHS after three or four years, if you're lucky. Overall, the effect on my life since I've had this has been extraordinary. Yeah, people still stop and stare, but it's not with pity or fear. They don't avoid me anymore. People tend to laugh with me, not at me. And the best thing for me is what I call the bionic effect. When we shake hands, people smile, and it's a genuine smile. I see that smile as a sign of acceptance for who I am. No one ever asked to shake my hook. In NHS Britain today, five limb fitting centres have had the foresight, empathy, balls, if you like, to supply these. Hopefully, the other 30 limb fitting centres will soon see the light and follow suit. 
I think we need to go a bit forward a bit. Um, life changing doesn't really have to be life ending. With the appropriate help, decent prosthetics, amputees can live the type of independent lives most of us take for granted. A new and different life. Just before I got this, I was speaking with a psychiatrist. He said, where do you see yourself in a year or so? I thought about it for a while. In a field, in the countryside, sitting in my car with a hose pipe attached to the exhaust. I wasn't trying to be dramatic. It's all I could see. No future. <sighs> How wrong was I? A year or so later, in June 2013, I stood on stage for the first time in my life and, and told my story. And before I go, I'd just like to say thank you for listening to a two-year-old. Thank you for being part of my new and different life. And I urge you, really, please go out and become part of someone else's new and different life. Thank you. I think you've inspired the audience, Nigel. Um, tell us a few practicalities. What can you do and what can't you do? Okay, well, I basically use this as you would use your left hand, I take it. I'm, I'm a left-handed person. Um, it's my assist hand. Um, I have my power grip, which is my handshake grip. This is the, the strong one. This is the one that will lift 40 kilos. Mm -hmm. um, I have a, a pinch grip for picking up light things. I have... This is key grip for credit cards, keys, reading a book, or whatever. Um, <coughs> if I'm using the mouse... Okay. Amazing. The new one's actually got a bit of program on it. The new one adjusts to the size of the mouse. You can do a single click, a double click, and drag and drop. <laughs> it's, not, it's not on this one yet, but uh, I've seen that work, and it's, it's pretty fantastic. Um, one of my favourite grips... I, I save this for kids when they're, when they're sort of staring. It's, sort of <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's brilliant, believe me. You know. And what are the downsides? The downsides at the moment, I'm a slave to the utility company. I have to plug it in every night to charge it, so solar power would be nice. Um, and also the expense. You know, um, People always ask me, how much do they cost, how expensive are they are? And if you're on your own, they cost a lot. But you can flip it. When I mean, you think about it, how, how little could it cost to buy one of these? 20 quid? If everyone who walks in this building today put 20 pounds in a box, you change your life tomorrow. Take it further, if everyone in London put 20 pence in a box, you change 100 lives. If you took the money the NHS can afford to pay the super managers, you'd buy 5,000 of these every year. Come on, that's madness. So expense, get them cheaper, get them more available. You know, the, the psychological benefits really outweigh anything this could ever do. They make you feel human again. So apart from telling your story and showing people Show what's possible, off and showing people the difference a prosthetic can make. Um, how do you feel you can move this revolution forwards? Well, you see, the thing is, everyone I speak to, will, they'll know an amputee, either indirectly or directly, they will know an amputee, everyone. But very few of them have seen this. So all I do is try and show off and let people see that it's not Terminator. I'm not going to destroy the world. <laughs> I'm just an ordinary bloke who can tie shoelaces up. You know, it's, it's no big deal. Get the technology out there, show the people it exists, and that will drive it because, let's face it, if you took your car to my garage for service, courtesy vehicle, sir? Oh, yes, please. There's a bike. Are you going to be happy? It does the same, gets you from A to B. 
It's not your luxury motor car. But pff, it don't matter. It's cheap. That's what we need to change. That, that whole mindset, that whole attitude. You've got some very well-connected people in this room. I think we have the beginnings of a movement. Um, Let's hope so. Nigel's going to be around. <laughs> Shake yep. his hand. Shall Thank you very much, you. Nigel Acton. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.